This week, we return to our series, Loving the Unlovable, and we find that when we love the unlovable, we can expect tough days. Now, in week one of the series, Jesus washed Judas's feet. The disciples were together with Jesus for one more meal, a supper together, before Jesus' crucifixion. And the disciples' feet, everyone's feet at the meal, they were dirty because they had been walking the dirty streets in open-footed sandals. And so it was a custom in that day for the host to provide a way for people to wash their feet before a meal. If the host was wealthy, the host would provide a servant to wash the feet of the guests. But let's just say this evening, no one was rushing to do what needed to be done. And so we discover that Jesus took off his outer garment. Jesus wrapped a towel around his waist. He got water and he went from disciple to disciple, washing and drying their feet. He was showing us what it is to love. And Jesus was loving the unlovable. Judas, you see, really qualifies as the unlovable. Judas was a member of Jesus' inner circle. Jesus invited Judas to do life with him, to learn from him, and Judas came into that inner circle. But we discover that later on the evening in John chapter 13, Judas gave uh, intelligence to the Jewish religious leaders, indicating where they could find Jesus in the middle of the night, alone, away from the crowds, so that the temple police could arrest Jesus. You see, Judas betrayed the Son of God. That makes Judas one of the greatest villains in all of history. Certainly, Judas is unlovable. Who else is unlovable? Now, in week one, I acknowledge the fact that if unlovable means that it is impossible to love someone, well, probably no one is truly unlovable. Well, what does unlovable mean then? To be unlovable means that we do not want to love that person, that it is difficult for us to love that person. And so for us, the unlovable would be our enemies. The unlovable would be people who have hurt us. Unlovable would be people who simply frustrate us at times. You see, this week we have to begin to expand our definition of who the unlovable are because we recognize the fact that as followers of Jesus, sometimes non-Christians can be unlovable to us. If unlovable means difficult to love, non-Christians can be difficult to love because they're so different from us. They think differently than we do. They speak differently than we do. They act differently than we do. And sometimes being different makes it uncomfortable for us. It makes it difficult for us to love when someone else is different. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to say. We become very uncomfortable, and we become afraid of being rejected or worse. Now, in the context of World Outreach Week, as we get to the definition of the unlovable, that they are the ones who are difficult to love because they are different from us, then we have to ask the question, are people around the world unlovable? Because they're different from us. And being different from us, it's difficult to love them. Are the people from around the world who come here and live next door to us unlovable because they're different from us and difficult to love. If you have come from around the world and are here, are the people who were here different from you and difficult to love, therefore unlovable for you? Those who are different from us, who make us uncomfortable, who are difficult for us to love, can be the unlovable. Now, I learned years ago that when you love people who are in some ways unlovable, you can expect some tough days. I learned it handing out light bulbs when I was planting a church. In 2008, when I was planting a church, it was a big thing for people with inefficient light bulbs to replace them with energy efficient light bulbs. So I had a bright idea. I bought a bunch of energy efficient light bulbs and I had a flyer produced to go along with it describing the fact that Jesus is the light of the world and inviting people to experience the light of the world through our church. So I went with a team to the local Walmart. We had permission. We stood outside of Walmart and we're handing out light bulbs along with these flyers. 
Now, some people took the light bulbs and the flyers, and they read the flyers. Some people took the light bulbs, and they tossed the flyers in the snow as they walked away. Then there were the people who just simply refused to take a free light bulb. I do not understand why a person would refuse a free light bulb. But then there were the people who refused to take the free light bulb and told me what I could do with that light bulb in colorful language. Now, of course, that made my day a little bit more difficult that day. I don't like to be rejected. I don't like to be opposed. No one does. In some ways, that was kind of a tough day for me. Well, what then are tough days? Because, of course, tough days mean something a little bit more than my inconvenient day. A tough day means really what Jesus was experiencing in John chapter 13. A tough day means a day that we are rejected and opposed. A tough day is a day when we may be betrayed, when we may be persecuted. And the Bible tells us that when we love people, when we love the unlovable, we can expect tough days. Which brings us to a question. How then are we to love the unlovable? Because we're not really big fans of tough days. In fact, we organize our lives to have good days. We want good, tough, problem-free days. And so when the Bible makes it clear to us that when we love, when we love practically and sacrificially, when we love the unlovable, we can expect tough days, then that leads to a question for us. How then am I to love the unlovable? Because I don't like tough days. And for the answer to that, we have to turn to the life of Jesus, because Jesus shows us how to love the unlovable despite tough days. As we turn to the Bible, let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious God, as we come to your word now, we long to hear your word, except when we don't, because when your word is difficult for us to hear, when it makes us uncomfortable, it's tough to hear. And so, God, speak to us, give us your word, even if that word is difficult and uncomfortable. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, Jesus had a tough day when he loved the unlovable. Jesus had a tough day when he loved the unlovable. We find a piece of that tough day in John chapter 13, verses 12 through 20. I'd like to read those for you now. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, Jesus said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking to all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Now, Jesus had a tough day when he loved the unlovable here because he's doing humiliating work. Jesus makes it clear that he knows who he is. He is master and teacher. He is Lord or Sir, the rabbi. And here we find Jesus, the Son of God, master, Lord, Sir, teacher, rabbi, stooping down to wash the feet of his students of his servants, of his creations. That's humiliating work. It's servant work in the first century. It's humiliating, and Jesus stooped down and did the humiliating work. Jesus was embracing his own tough day. While doing so, Jesus 
was living under the full weight of knowing about Judas's betrayal. You see, Judas's betrayal is deeper than we understand. Of course, the servant betrayed the master. The creature betrayed the creator. But beyond that, and in that culture, it is worse, a friend betrayed his friend. That's worse in that culture than a master being betrayed by his servant. But even worse than that, after Jesus extended hospitality to Judas, Judas betrayed his host. And that undermined the very basis of first century Jewish society. Judas's betrayal was profound, and Jesus felt the weight of it all. Jesus was having a very tough day. But Judas's betrayal was just the beginning of what was happening around Jesus. You see, the Jewish religious leaders had made up their mind about Jesus. They had rejected him as a crazy man, as a dangerous person. They had begun to oppose him very publicly to his face, seeking to undermine him in the face of the crowds. But beyond that, privately, they had come to the decision that Jesus had to be eliminated. And so they had been plotting his death downfall, plotting even his death. They planned to arrest him, try him, and kill him. They were persecuting Jesus, and Jesus knew all of this. It was weighing on him that night. Jesus was having a very tough day. But on top of that, we recognize that Jesus washing the feet of his disciples is foreshadowing even more suffering for Jesus to come. Because Jesus washing the feet of his disciples is foreshadowing the cross. Jesus tells us himself that when he stooped down to wash the feet of his disciples, he was setting an example for them. He was showing them what godly love looks like. Godly love is practical and it is sacrificial. And Jesus was demonstrating them to them the fact that his love was practical and sacrificial. And he would take the example of what he had done in foot washing and take it to its natural conclusion. Jesus would demonstrate the full extent of godly practical, sacrificial love on the cross. In loving his disciples, Jesus would die on the cross to pay the price for their sin. In loving us, Jesus would die on the cross to pay the price for our sin. Jesus' tough day in washing his disciples' feet, in experiencing Judas' betrayal and knowing the betrayal, the rejection, the opposition, and the persecution of the Jewish religious leaders, it was only it was only going to get worse. Jesus experienced a tough day. Jesus tells us, though, that we are to expect tough days when we love the unlovable. Jesus told us to expect tough days when we love the unlovable. In John chapter 13, verses 14 and 15 that I read to you earlier, Jesus makes explicit the fact that what he did in washing feet is an example that he has set for us. Let me remind you of those verses again. Verses 14 and 15 say, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done to you. In verse 13, Jesus said, you've called me teacher and Lord. And he affirms the fact that he is teacher and Lord. In fact, he goes further to imply that he is God himself, which we know to be true. But then in these verses, he says, if I, your teacher, your Lord, your master, your savior, your creator, if I wash your feet, then you should wash one another's feet. In other words, the instruction that he's giving, he is making explicit the fact that he expects something from them and us. If Jesus serves people, we serve people. If Jesus loves people practically and sacrificially, then we love people practically and sacrificially. If Jesus loves the unlovable, then we love the unlovable. Jesus is telling us that we are to do what he has done. But then he goes further to say that when we do what it is that he has done, we should expect the same results that he has gotten. In verse 16, he adds, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. 
Now, Jesus is talking about the fact that we have been sent by him. In the gospel according to John, Jesus sends his disciples. He sends us. He sends us to the world to love people, to love them practically and sacrificially, to carry the good news about the kingdom of God with us and to share it with others. And he's telling us that when we do so, we are representing him. We are representing the kingdom of God. We are his ambassadors. But he's going on to say that if when you represent me, when you share this good news and when you show my love, if they rejected me, then they are going to reject you. If they embrace me, they will embrace you. But if they rejected me, they will reject you. If they reject and oppose and betray and persecute me, then they will reject and oppose and betray and persecute you. He makes this very clear in verse 20 of chapter 15, which happened on that same evening. He draws out the conclusion. He says, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So if Jesus had tough days, then we should expect tough days. If loving the unlovable led to tough days for Jesus, then loving the unlovable is going to lead to tough days for us. Which has to lead us back up, to back up and just ask a question. Is what Jesus said to us the same thing that the Shirelles said in the song Mama Said? If you've ever listened to the verses of Mama Said, it's kind of a sad song, really, because in the verses, there's a person who is loving and wanting to be loved, but she is unloved. That's that's the verses of the song. Then the chorus always comes back, Mama said there'd be days like this, there'll be days like this, Mama said. And now, if I understand that song correctly, I really don't want her mother as my mother. Because here you have a a woman saying, I want to be loved, and yet I am lonely. I love others, they do not love me back. I seek to be loved, no one does it. The ones who love me are not the ones I want to be loved by. Mom, life is tough. And mom says, yeah, that happens. I don't know about you, but if I go to my mom looking for comfort, I'm looking for something a little more than that. Maybe ice cream, maybe a hug. But is Jesus saying the same thing to us here? We go to him and we say, Jesus, when I do what you tell me to do, when I love the unlovable, I experience tough days. Is Jesus saying, well, Jesus said there'd be days like this. There'd be days like this, my Savior said. Is that what we're getting (laughs) from John 13? Well, not exactly. Not exactly. And it begins in verse 20 where Jesus reminds us that what we are experiencing when we love the unlovable, what we get back when we experience tough days, is about more than just us. Verse 20 says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. In other words, when Jesus sends us out, to love, to love practically and sacrificially, to love the unlovable, to share good news about the kingdom of God, people are not simply making a decision about us. We've been sent. They are now making a decision about the one who sent us. We think that it's all about us, that they accept us or reject us. They embrace us or oppose us. They're with us or they betray us. They're for us or they persecute us. But Jesus is saying, no, it's not all about you. They are accepting or rejecting me and my Father. He makes this connection explicit in Luke chapter 10, verse 16, where Jesus says, the one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. So when we run into tough days While we're loving the unlovable, we think it is all about us, but it turns out it's not all about us. Tough days happen, but they are because we have been sent by God. People are rejecting and opposing and betraying and persecuting him and not just us. Jesus told us to expect tough days when we love the unlovable, but it's not all about us. 
Beyond that, Jesus makes it very clear in this passage that tough days are not the end. Tough days, as it turns out, don't derail God's plan. You see, we have the experience of thinking that God's plan is derailed every time we run into tough days. When we run into rejection and opposition and betrayal and persecution, we get the sense that God's plan must be coming off the tracks and that it has become a wreck. And Jesus anticipates that about his own disciples. Because in this moment, as he speaks to his disciples, he recognizes that very shortly, they're going to find out that Judas has betrayed him and them. They're going to see their master arrested. They're going to see him put on trial, and they're going to hear that he is crucified. They're going to hear that he is dead, and they are going to think that the entire enterprise, the kingdom of God enterprise, the entire Jesus mission has come off its rails. And so ahead of time, Jesus is letting them know, no, this enterprise is not off its rails. It is happening just as as prophecies said it would. It is going according to God's plan. And if you will think about it and look back on it in the right way, it'll give you even more reasons to believe. In John chapter 13, verses 18 through 19, Jesus said, but the scripture will be fulfilled. And here's the scripture that will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. In other words, even though we are tempted to believe that when we experience tough days, God's plan has come off the rails, God's plan may very well be completely on track. Now, in John chapter 13, verse 18, Jesus is quoting from a prophecy in the Old Testament that describes just how tough the days are going to get. You see, when Jesus said, he who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me, he's not only talking about the fact that Judas, who has eaten his bread at the table with Jesus, is going to lift his heel, is going to betray Jesus, he is quoting from Psalm 41. Now, when Jesus quotes from Psalm 41, he doesn't just quote a fragment of it. By quoting a fragment of it, he kind of cues the entire psalm in the minds of his disciples. They very likely would have had Psalm 41 memorized. And when Jesus quoted a line from Psalm 41, he's in a sense invoking the entire psalm. And the psalm tells us just how bad tough days can get. Because Psalm 41 tells about the psalmist who has a group of friends who have rejected him. They oppose him. They are plotting his downfall, and they are seeking to kill the psalmist. This is exactly how tough the day is going to get for Jesus. And Psalm 41 invokes all of that, but Psalm 41 also implies that that's not the end. Tough days are not the end. Because in Psalm 41, after the plot has been hatched, verses 10 through 12 of Psalm 41 continue, but you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you delight in me. My enemy will not shout in triumph over me, but you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever." So what happens after tough days? After tough days do their worst, God raises up his servant. And having raised up his servant, he exalts and glorifies his servant, and his servant exists beside the Father forever. Do you see a pattern here? You see, Jesus' crucifixion, the tough days of his crucifixion, are overturned in his resurrection. And Jesus is pointing us forward to his crucifixion and his resurrection here in quoting Psalm 41. Jesus' crucifixion represents the worst of the tough days because, you see, Jesus is betrayed by his friend. He is arrested and tried by his subjects. He's condemned and crucified by the conquering army that dominated his people. And then the Lord of life dies on the cross. And the creator of the earth is buried in the earth. Jesus was having the toughest of days. But Jesus is pointing to us 
pointing out to us here the fact that God overturns that crucifixion because three days later, Jesus rises from the dead, resurrected and glorified. Jesus ascends to heaven and he stands at the right hand of God the Father. Jesus' crucifixion, the tough day of his crucifixion is overturned in his resurrection and glorification. And the same thing is true of us. In the tough days of our lives, the tough days of our lives are overturned in God's plan for the future. Tough days are not the end for us. When tough days have done the worst that they can do to us, we do not get God's plan for eternity as simply a reward for going through those tough days. It's not some kind of pie-in-the-sky thing that happens at the end to give us the strength to endure. It's not as if simply because we experience tough days, then at the end we are resurrected, we are glorified, creation is consummated, and we spend eternity with God as a reward. It is a reward, but it is something far deeper. Resurrection, glorification, consummation, and eternity overturn the tough days of our lives. It is as if God is saying a definitive no to evil and persecution and betrayal and opposition and rejection and tough days and demonstrating the fact that God wins. Tough days are not the end. But when we expect tough days... When we expect tough days, we can love the unlovable. When we expect tough days, we can love the unlovable. So let's expect tough days. Let's expect tough days. There are going to be days in our lives when we are rejected and opposed and betrayed and persecuted. If we love, we will face tough days. If we love the unlovable, We will face tough days. We will face good days, too. But we will face tough days. Let's expect tough days. But not only do we expect tough days, but we press on despite tough days. Let's press on despite tough days. You see, Jesus sets an example for us. And he says, I have served, I have loved, I have loved practically and sacrificially, I have loved the unlovable practically and sacrificially. Now I expect you to do the same. But when we recognize that loving and loving practically and sacrificially and loving the unlovable leads to tough days, we have a decision to make. Will we do what Jesus has shown us to do? But that's the point at which we have to recognize that Jesus' example is also a command. Jesus commands us, knowing that tough days are coming, to press on, to love, to love practically, to love sacrificially, to love the unlovable. Let's press on despite tough days. Christians in Ukraine right now are demonstrating for us what it looks like to press on despite tough days. Bombs have been falling on the Ukraine for more than a month now. People have been dying in the Ukraine for more than a month. Many of us have been praying for people in the Ukraine. Personally, I felt led to pray for the followers of Jesus in the Ukraine. And as I pray for Christians in Ukraine, what I really want to pray is for their safety and security. But I feel convicted that what I have to pray for for the Christians in Ukraine is that they be faithful in this moment and effective in ministry for God in these days. And Christians in Ukraine are living in tough days. But the Christians in the Ukraine living in tough days are doing bold things to follow Jesus' example and his command. Christians in the Ukraine are standing faithfully. They are doing ministry. They are loving. They are loving practically and sacrificially. They are pressing on despite tough days. We have a video today from a church in the Ukraine that tells us about what they're going through. I'd like for you to watch that video now. (laughs) 
February 24th was not a usual day. Children didn't go to school. Adults didn't go to work. Instead of starting another new day, they had to hide. Russia attacked Ukraine at 5 o'clock in the morning. And since then, Russian armed forces have been constantly destroying our country, killing both military and civilians. Thousands of people have become homeless. Some have lost husbands, wives, sons, children. And today we as church have come together to help those people. Every day we send drivers from our church to evacuate children and women from the war zones. They are so eager to help, consciously putting themselves in danger. There is a high risk of coming under fire. Such cases have already occurred and there have been victims. It's extremely difficult to get to those places. Many highways and roads have been completely destroyed, as well as bridges, so they have to take detours. Normally, the road from Kyiv to Rivne would take four hours. Now it takes 12. That's why we spend lots of money on fuel. Every evening, we receive hundreds of refugees from the hotspots. We host them overnight, at schools, at our local orphan house, at homes and in the morning we send them to Poland. Apart from that, our volunteers are finding a temporary place for living in Western Ukraine for those who don't want to or can't go abroad. Many refugees are afraid, anxious, with no understanding of what to do. They spent a week in the basement with no access to the shower. There are many people with special needs and disabilities among them as well. When they come here, they are panicking and crying. We approach them, embrace, comfort, and listen to them. They open up to us so we can share the gospel and evangelize. We pray with them and bless them. Here is one of the hundreds of stories. My village is not destroyed yet. However, Russian military and Russian tanks are everywhere there. People are afraid. My parents were left there. I feel so bad for them. Russians are killing civilians, they are shooting at them. That leaves us in tears, speechless. We ask God to give us the right words of comfort. In the meantime, we pack humanitarian aid, medicine, food, warm clothes, blankets, pillows, sleeping bags, mattresses, and send them to the war zones, to the cities that have been attacked, bombarded, and destroyed. And there are still many people who stayed there, who had no opportunity or refused to go. Thank God the situation in Rivne is currently still, though there are lots of checkpoints at the entrances to the city, and we hear the loud siren all over the city alerting about the air raids from time to time. We never know what tomorrow holds. Understanding this encourages us to serve boldly as long as we can, to help as many people as we can, to evacuate as many as we can, to love and evangelize as much as we can. To do as much as we can to save Ukraine. The needs are huge. Stand with us and help us. So just to be sure you understand what the video has said, the people in the eastern parts of the Ukraine are experiencing extraordinarily tough days. Bombs are falling, buildings are being destroyed. They're going without basic needs. They're experiencing desperately tough days in the eastern part of Ukraine. The church in the video is in the western part of the Ukraine. And seeking to be faithful witnesses for Christ in these days, they are sending relief supplies in vans. Vans leave the church in the west, in Rivna, and go to the eastern cities full of relief supplies. When they reach those cities, they offload the supplies and they load on refugees seeking to make their way to the west. Then the drivers bring those vans through checkpoints with bombs falling and with snipers shooting at them. And they bring those refugees west. They're doing that in very tough days. When they reach Rivna, the church in the west, the church there is organized to provide relief, food, toiletries, an opportunity to shower, and they're sharing the gospel with everyone who comes before sending them the next day on toward the west and towards safety. They're ministering in the midst of tough days. 
After this video was made, bombs began to fall on Rivna itself as well. These are tough days. And the Christians in the Ukraine are making the choice to press on and to love despite tough days. Let's press on and love despite tough days. Beyond that, let's love the unlovable anyway. Let's love the unlovable anyway. As we look at our Ukrainian brothers and sisters, it's a joy that we have to be able to partner with them. The church in Rivna is part of a network of churches, and the network that we're a part of, Converge, is partnered with that Baptist network in the Ukraine. And through Converge, we have sent relief money to that network and to the Ukraine. I'm so glad that we have the opportunity to partner with them and do something about this crisis. But beyond partnering with them, can we do more than partner with our Ukrainian brothers and sisters from a distance? And that more that I hope we can do is, can we learn from them? Because as we look at their example, we find examples of Christians who are loving, who are loving practically and sacrificially, and who are loving in the midst of tough days. Can we learn from their example? But their example points us to Jesus. And as we look at what Jesus is saying to us, we see in Jesus' example that he loves, that he loves practically and sacrificially. Can we follow that example? But as we look at Jesus too, can we follow his command? Because his command is to love practically and sacrificially, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's inconvenient, even when we face tough days. And as we look to Jesus, Jesus takes the example of the Ukrainians one step further. And Jesus calls us not just to love in the midst of tough days. Jesus calls us to love the unlovable in the midst of tough days. Can we do that? Let's love the unlovable despite tough days days. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today seeking to be obedient to you. We see the example of Jesus Christ who loves, who loves in a godly way, who loves practically and sacrificially, who loves even the unlovable. Heavenly Father, we look at that example and we recognize that when we love the unlovable, it produces tough days in our lives. And it leads us to the question, how? How might we love the unlovable when it leads to tough days? God, would you show us how? Would you give us the strength to love the unlovable despite tough days? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.